Vice President. Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as the supreme being most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you, on us who are members of this Senate and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O oh Lord, in our deliberations so that setting aside private interests, unwholesome prejudices, and personal affections, we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Announcements by the Vice President. Honorable Senators, I wish to advise that the President of the Senate, Senator the Honorable Christine Kangaloo, is currently out of the country. Honorable Senators, I have granted leave of absence to Senator the Honorable Franklin Khan and Senator Saddam Hussein, both of whom are ill. And if you would permit me, I crave your indulgence to return to this item as I am awaiting correspondence from the Office of the President. Honorable Senators, I have received the following correspondence from the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Establishment of a Joint Select Committee. At a sitting held on Wednesday, December the 12th, 2019, the House of Representatives agreed to the following resolution. Resolved that in accordance with Standing Order 68-1, the Cannabis Control Bill 2019 be referred to a joint select committee hereby established and that this committee be empowered to consider and report on the general merits and principles of the bill and report by February 29th, 2020. I request that the Senate be informed of this decision at the earliest convenience, please. Honorable Bridget Mary Anaset George, MP, Speaker of the House. Bills brought from the House of Representatives on the supplemental order paper, the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Bill 2019, in the name of the Attorney General. Attorney General. Sorry, I have no procedure yet, sir. Need our government business? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, in accordance with Standing Order 62-1B, I beg to move that the next stage of the Dangerous Drugs Bill 2019 be taken later in the proceedings. Honorable Senators, the question is that the next stage of the bill be taken later in the proceedings. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The next stage of the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Bill 2019 will be taken later in the proceedings. Petitions, papers. Minister in the Ministry of Finance. Mr. Vice President, I don't have the papers. I'm only treating you so. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, apologies again. I have the honor to lay the following papers as listed on the order paper and supplemental order paper in the name of the Minister of Finance. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Finance to the 20th report 
of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee on the examination of the audited financial statements of the Palo Seco Agricultural Enterprises Limited for the financial years 2012 to 2017. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Finance with the 23rd report of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee on the examination of the audited financial statements of InvestTT Limited for the years 2014 to 2017 and the report of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago with respect to the progress of the proposals to restructure CLECO, BAT, and the CIB for the quarter ended September 30, 2019. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Leader of Government Business. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to lay the following papers listed on the supplemental order paper in the name of the Minister in the Ministry of the Office of the Prime Minister. The ministerial response of the Office of the Prime Minister to the 11th report of the Joint Select Committee on Human Rights, Equality and Diversity on the status of the implementation of the recommendations of the third report of the Joint Select Committee on Human Rights, Equality and Diversity into the treatment of child offenders. I thank you. Reports from committees. Senator the Honorable Clarence Rambert. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to present the following reports as listed on the order paper and the supplemental order paper in my name. One, the interim report of the Joint Select Committee appointed to consider and report on the National Statistical Institute of Trinidad and Tobago Bill 2018, fifth session 2019-2020, 11th Parliament. And second, the first interim report of the Joint Select Committee on the Cybercrime Bill 2017, fifth session 2019-2020, 11th Parliament. I thank you. Urgent questions? Senator Mark, Senator Bika, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. To the Minister of Finance, in light of reports that banks are charging a fee to customers to change their paper-based $100 notes to the new polymer bills, can the Minister advise as to what is being done to address this issue? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Notwithstanding the fact that I received the email with respect to this urgent question at 9.54 a.m., I will still try my best to answer it. Under the Central Bank Act, Section 44A, the Central Bank may fix the maximum and minimum interest rates payable on deposits received and may fix the maximum and minimum interest rates, fees, and charges to be charged on loans, advances, or other credit facilities. So under the current law, the central bank is empowered to fix bank charges and fees with respect to loans and credit advances, not other transactions such as over-the-counter services, um, exchanging of notes, deposits, etc. This may require some reflection in the future to see whether we should amend the law to give the central bank the power to fix fees for these routine transactions. However, that could be construed as interference in the business of the commercial banking sector. What I can say is that, as I indicated at the press conference yesterday, I have requested the banks to see whether they could either relax or eliminate the standard fees that they charge for deposits and for changing of notes at this point in time. However, these fees have been, existence, have been in existence for quite a long time and are quite standard. I'm told that not all of the banks are charging fees for deposits and exchanging of notes. Uh, some of the banks are not, some of the banks are, but that has been their practice for many, many years. So what we're going to use at this point in time is some sort of collaborative effort, some sort of suasion to see because of the large number of transactions taking place whether um, they can relax their fees. But you have to understand it's also an expense for the banks having to deal with these transactions. So we're in constant discussions with the banks to try and accommodate people and try and make this process as inconvenient as possible. So I will keep you updated as we go along. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Honorable Minister of Finance, for the, for the answer. Given senior citizens, who are, many senior citizens came with this issue, what is the possibility of, for example, other offices being, able, being available, warden offices, for example, 
for changing of the $100 bills? Can your minister indicate if that is a possibility? Allow that question. Next question, Senator Beaker. You have a second supplement. Uh, then, um, can the Honourable Minister at least plead with the banks in the case of senior citizens regarding the changing of notes? In, in, in like, can the okay. Honourable Minister, can I ask the Honourable Minister, if in light of banks um, having their cost of operations, can, can there be a specific plea regarding senior citizens changing their pension cash that they already cashed already at the beginning of the month or their savings? Minister of Finance. Certainly. I will certainly do that. Yes. Senator Mark. <clears throat> Thank you. To the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government, in light, <clears throat> in light of widespread flooding in South and Central Trinidad, can the Minister indicate what urgent relief is being provided to the people of these areas? Minister of Rural Development, Acting Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I thank Senator Mark for the question. The Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, through the Municipal Corporations, the 14, mobilized its first responder protocols at the earliest reports of flooding on Wednesday this week. Disaster management unit officials are presently on the ground in various communities and are addressing reports of flooding, landslips, fallen walls, fallen trees, and damaged roof. Among the regions most affected, Mr. Vice President, are the Pinal Debe region, Mayaru, Rio Claro, Siparia, Princess Town, and Point Fortin. Mr. Vice President, you would know that Pinal Debe, Mayaru, Rio Claro, and to a lesser extent, Princess Town, particularly Moruga, are some of the traditional areas affected in this way when we have persistent rainfall as we've been having since Wednesday. Accordingly, the shelter managers and community emergency response teams, those teams of volunteers who have been trained by the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government across the country over the last few years are out in the field. Officials continue to conduct assessment to areas where the waters have sub subsided and relief operations are underway. And Mr. Vice President, the Minister of Works and Transport and the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government have been out since early this morning as they have been since Wednesday, and they are providing support to all these teams that are out there. Fallen trees and walls have been cleared, and this is with the support of the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service, the Trinidad and Tobago Police, Police Service, Forestry Division, Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, Ministry of Works and Transport, and of course the corporations. Relief items such as sandbags, tarps, and mattresses have been distributed, and this is through ODPM and the disaster management units in the various corporations. Corporations have utilized trucks to transport residents in affected areas as some roads remain impassable to low vehicles. For example, Mr. Vice President, the road that connects Rio Claro to, to Mayaro in the Mafican area, as the rain subsides, and in fact, as the rest of the country is bathed in sun, that area is sometimes flooding. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. And to Mark. I ask the Honorable Minister whether the Army and the Fire Services have been deployed in the affected areas to assist residents in seeking to bring about restoration to their homes, having, having had um, the rains being um, subsided somewhat, will the Army and the Fire Service be deployed, among other agencies, to assist residents to restore their places, um, their residences? Acting Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I thank my colleague for an excellent supplemental question. And I was about to say that in Pinal Debe Regional Corporation, for example, 15 families have been evacuated. And these families have been evacuated with the support of the Defense Force. And while, as Senator Mark correctly says, the rain has stopped in most parts of the country, I was making the point in the Mafeking area, the water will get to Mafeking out of Princess Town and out of Ottawa and the, and the lagoons in that area. The water will now accumulate in Mafeking, and that is an area in which the Defense Force historically has provided relief because they have the trucks that, that would get into the, through the main road and intrude those areas which are 
very difficult to pass the water on the road is at sometimes a depth of eight feet. So that is where the Defense Force and all the other state agencies are mobilized in response, in providing support, in the distribution of supplies, <coughs> and all the corporations in the country, led by the Minister of Rural Development and local government, is engaged out on the field. Thank you. Senator Mark. Next question, Senator Mark. To the Minister of National Security. Given reports of citizens being robbed at gunpoint as they seek to exchange their paper-based $100 notes, what measures are being implemented by law enforcement to ensure the security of citizens seeking to conduct demonetization transactions? Minister of National Security. Good morning, Mr. Vice President. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice President, the first thing I'd like to start off by saying is continuing from the conversation I started yesterday at Post Cabinet, which is to thank all of our security forces. In fact, on my way to work this morning, I stopped and thanked some of them personally that were carrying out their job and their duty. The second point I'd like to make is to all of our citizens and all of the persons who are going through the demonetization exercise and exchanging their $100 notes, they need to be very careful and they need to be cautious. The banks are working with us. The banks have increased their private security. The police and the defense force are also assisting with a security blanket. Unfortunately, there will be some instances when people can be, be vulnerable and we're just asking them to be cautious with it. Do you really need to leave with big amounts of money and tens of thousands of dollars in notes? In any event, the security services or state security apparatus is out there working. They've doubled up their efforts, and they're working along with the private security supplied to the various banks. The time for urgent questions has ended. Yeah. Questions on notice, questions for all answer. Senator um, Leader of Government Business. Mr. Vice President, the government will respond to the three questions on notice. Um, posed to the Minister of National Security and the Minister of Finance. Thank you. Senator Mark. Um, question 19. Question number 19 to the Minister of Energy and Energy Industry. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. On behalf of the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, the answer to question 19 is as follows. Heritage Petroleum Company Limited has paid its supplemental income tax related to the period January 2019 to March 2019. The amount paid was 200 million eight hundred and seventy one thousand three hundred and nine dollars and twenty four cents. I, I am advised. Next question, Senator Ma. Question number 20, to the Minister of National Security. Minister of National Security. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, the Commissioner of Police has advised as follows. There have been instances of Venezuelan nationals involved in violent crimes in Trinidad and Tobago. While there has not been substantial evidence to support the existence of Venezuelan gangs, their association with local criminals is possible. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service will continue its intelligence efforts along with the assistance of the other arms of intelligence that exist in national security to identify any organized crime groups that can be classified as gangs of any nationality operating within our jurisdiction. And this effort, which is an ongoing effort, is not limited to any nationality whatsoever. Senator Mark. Mr. President, can the minister indicate whether you can identify how many um, Venezuelan gangs may be in operation or in existence in this country at this material point in time. Are you in a position to share with this honorable Senate? Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Senator Mark, as I had stated a short while ago, according to the Commissioner of Police, there is no substantial evidence to support the existence of Venezuelan gangs 
operating in Trinidad and Tobago. There may be Venezuelan nationals who are now associating themselves with the criminal elements in Trinidad and Tobago, but not any formal gangs from Venezuela operating within our borders. Dr. Mark. Can I ask the Honorable Minister what steps are being taken to monitor the presence of these criminal elements from neighboring Venezuela who are located in Trinidad and Tobago um, at this time by the Ministry of National Security. Ministry of Nas Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, as to the specifics of the operations and how intelligence is gathered and how people are monitored, obviously I wouldn't be able to say that. But what I can say is exactly what I said a short while ago. All of our agencies have their intelligence tentacles out there and they're monitoring criminal activity, not only criminal activity associated with foreign nationals. The minister indicated whether there's a correlation between the presence of these Venezuelan criminal elements and the spike in violent crimes in our country, particularly murders. Minister. Okay. Next question, Senator Ma. Yes, question number 21 to the Minister of National Security. Minister of National Security. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. The Chief of Defense Staff of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force has indicated that as mandated under the Defense Act, Chapter 1401 of the Laws of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force Coast Guard continues to provide A, safety and security for all mar marinas transiting within our maritime zones once they are legal, legitimate, and provided their, their paths that they intend to take, B, border security in order to detect Ill illicit and illegal activities within our maritime boundaries. And C, a safe environment for all mariners, inclusive of local yacht owners. After the unfortunate attacks by armed Spanish-speaking assailants on the 14th of April 2019, the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard met with representatives from the Yacht Services Association of Trinidad and Tobago on April 15th, the next day. Safety measures were discussed and contingency plans were implemented. The Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard also reminded the Yacht Services Association and its membership of its responsibility as mariners to ensure that all safety requirements are implemented and communication is maintained with the Coast Guard on North Coast Radio in the event of any emergency. Additionally, the Yacht Services Association of Trinidad and Tobago has also advised that yacht owners be reminded of their responsibility to find float plan, file float plans. These plans include details of the yacht's planned trip, export, expected ports, arrival dates and times, and important information relating to the vessel should search and rescue activities become necessary. This will assist the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard in tracking the vessels as they transit through our territorial waters. Daily patrols have been conducted within areas which are heavy po heavily populated by yachts such as Cruising, San Fernando Yacht Club, Store Bay, Charlotteville Bay, Coral Cove, Powerboats, Peak, Scotland Bay, and Shaka Shakari. Subsequent to the unfortunate incident at sea, four convoys consisting of 28 yachts were monitored and escorted into territorial waters to ensure that their transit was incident free. This mission was easily facilitated as the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard was able to access the filed float plans for the above mentioned vessels. Of course, when they, Senator Mark, when they file their float plans with us in advance, we're then able to use a coastal tracking system, a coastal radar system, to track them and see if any other vessels are coming to intercept. Senator Mark. Vice President, may I ask you, Honorable Minister, is there any plan to have a closer working relationship between our Coast Guard and the Venezuelan Coast Guard in order to prevent these pirates <coughs> or assailants Sorry. from, you know, almost invading our waters well, yeah. will yeah. and bringing about distress to our citizens. Minister of National Security. The answer is yes. In fact, on one of my recent visits to Venezuela, I did meet with all of the arms of their national security apparatus, including those charged, both their Navy and their Coast Guard, charged with the responsibility. And we are working, our Coast Guard is working in tandem with their operations and their assets. 
um, Honorable Sir Vice Tamar. President, can I ask the Honorable Minister whether since his meeting with his counterparts in Venezuela and this incident in April of 2019, can the Minister indicate whether there has been a reduction in um, attacks um, by these Venezuelan pirates, assailants, against our citizens who are carrying out their legitimate business, yachting that is, within our territorial waters? Minister of National Security. President, the answer is yes, but even before then, because of course this incident you referred to, Minister Mark, Senator Mark, was on April 14th of this year. Knock on wood, so far there have been no further incidents with our members of our yachting fraternity going out there, and that is as a result of the work we're doing and the joint efforts, and let's hope that it stays that way. Thank you. Honourable members, at this time, permit me to return to item three on the other paper. The Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, by Her Excellency Paula May Weeks, ORTT, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, to Mr. Ndali Young. Whereas, Senator the Honorable Christine Kangaloo is incapable of performing her duties as the President of the Senate by reason of her absence from Trinidad and Tobago, and the Vice President of the Senate is required to perform the duties of the President of the Senate as a result, a vacancy has arisen in the Senate. Now, therefore, I, Paula May Weeks, President as aforesaid, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 44 of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, do hereby appoint you and Dali Young to be a member of the Senate temporarily with effect from the 13th of December 2019 and continuing during the absence from Trinidad and Tobago of Senator the Honorable Christine Kangaloo, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the, Repub of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the office of the President St. Anne's this 12th day of December, 2019. To Mr. Augustus Thomas, whereas Senator the Honorable Franklin Kahn is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of illness, now therefore I, Paula May Weeks, President as aforesaid, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister in exercise of the power vested in me by sections 44.1b and 44.4a of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, do hereby appoint you, Augustus Thomas, to be a member of the Senate temporarily with effect from the 13th of December 2019 and continuing during the absence of Senator the Honorable Franklin Kahn by reason of illness, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President St. Anne's this 12th day of December 2019. Honorable Senators, Senators are required to take the oath. I, and Young, having been appointed a member of Parliament, do solemnly affirm that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago will uphold the Constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, upon which I am about to enter. Augustus Thomas, having been appointed a member of parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, upon which I am about to enter.
leave to move the adjournment the adjournment of the Senate on definite matters of urgent public importance. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, in accordance with Standing Order 16.2, I hereby seek your leave to move the adjournment of the Senate for the purpose of discussing a definite matter of urgent public importance. Namely, the failure of the government to render adequate aid to citizens affected by severe flooding, which occurred from December 11th to December 12th, 2019. The matter is definite as it pertains specifically to severe and widespread flooding that impacted parts of Central and South Trinidad from December 11th to the 12th, 2019, and the government's complete disregard of the plight of our fellow citizens. The matter is urgent because affected citizens are in desperate need of assistance, and the current administration has not taken the necessary steps to assess citizens whose homes have been desolated by the severe flooding. The matter is of public importance since it is the government's duty to protect the lives and properties of citizens. And this administration has once again demonstrated to the population that they are not concerned with their well being. At least 15 families had to abandon their homes, and many other citizens are in dire need of government assistance, which thus far has been grossly inadequate. I thank you for your consideration of this critically important matter, Mr. Vice President. Honorable Senators, I have considered the motion of the Senator and I am not satisfied that this matter as presented qualifies under the standing order. Senator Mark. Mr. Vice President, in accordance with standing order 16.2, I hereby seek your leave to move the adjournment of the Senate for the purpose of discussing a definite matter of urgent public importance, namely the extreme inconvenience currently being endured by the national community as a result of the demonetization of the $100 currency note and replacement with other tender. The matter is definite because it relates to the deadline given by the government of 14 working days for all current paper-based 100 bills, $100 bills that is, to be replaced by polymer, $100 notes, through the nation's banking system, resulting in the confusion being experienced by the country as a result of the poor planning and execution in what could have been, in what could have and should have been a routine process. The matter is urgent because the chaos that has overtaken the nation's banking system results from the announcement that after 14 working days, the old $100 bill will no longer be legal tender, causing panic over the sudden, arbitrary, and absolute threat to citizens' monetary savings. The matter is of public importance because of the resultant havoc is this development is creating long lines of citizens with substantial cash deposits providing easy targets for criminal elements, hampering seasonal Christmas commerce, disrupting work routines, and placing the commercial banking system under 
unprecedented pressure. I thank you, Mr. Vice President, for your consideration of this critically important matter. Honorable Senators, I have considered the motion of the Senator, and I am not satisfied that this matter as presented qualifies under this standing order. Motions relating to the business and sittings of the Senate are moved by a minister. Acting Leader of Government Business. Mr. Vice President, having regard to the correspondence from the Speaker of the House in relation to the establishment of a joint select committee to consider and report by February 29, 2020, on the Cannabis Control Bill 2019. I beg to move that the Senate concur with the House of Representatives in the establishment of the committee and that the following six senators be appointed to serve. Mr. Clarence Rambarat, Mr. Nigel De Freitas, Mrs. Paula Gopiskun, Mr. Tahaka Obika, Mr. Paul Richards, and Ms. Sophia Choate, Senior Counsel. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Senate concur with the House of Representatives in the establishment of a joint select committee to consider and report by February 29, 2020 on the Cannabis Control Bill 2019 and that the following six senators be appointed to serve. Mr. Clarence Rambarat, Mr. Nigel De Freitas, Mrs. Paula Gupiskun, Mr. Tahaka Obika, Mr. Paul Richards, and Ms. Sophia Choate, SC. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Acting Leader of Government Business. Mr. Vice President, having regard to the interim report of the Joint Select Committee on the National Statistical Institute of Trinidad and Tobago Bill 2018, I beg to move that the committee be granted an extension to March 31st, 2020 to complete its work and submit a final report. Thank you. Honorable Senators, the question is that the interim report of the Joint Select Committee on the National Statistical Institute of Trinidad and Tobago Bill 2018 be granted an extension to March 31st, 2020 to complete its work and submit a final report. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Acting Leader of Government Business. Mr. Vice President, having regard to the interim report of the Joint Select Committee on the Cyber Crime Bill 2017, I beg to move that the committee be granted an extension to March 31st, 2020 to complete its work and submit a final report. I thank you. Honorable Senators, the question is that the interim report of the Joint Select Committee on the Cybercrime Bill 2017 be granted an extension to March 31st, 2020 to complete its work and submit a final report. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I would like at this point in time to crave your indulgence. I am awaiting a third instrument of appointment, so we will revert to item three once I have received that instrument. Public business, government business, bill second reading. Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I beg to move that an act to amend the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125, be now read a second time. Mr. Vice President, Trinidad and Tobago has a number of issues at its feet. Certainly, crime and criminality is a significant issue that must be managed. Our economy is a significant issue that must continuously be managed. But it is social justice in its very pure form that is paramount as a feature of all of our issues and certainly as a feature of this legislation. This bill seeks to amend the Dangerous Drugs Act. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Vice President, the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125, is an act of parliament, number 38 of 1991. It was amended in 1994, 1995, 2000, 2000 again, in 2014 last. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Vice President, forgive me, I was just in the House the day before. Um, the concept of dangerous drugs really is something that springs from our cultural association with opioids, 
with what have become known as psychotropic substances, those drugs which are scheduled in the first and second schedule of the Dangerous Drugs Act, but it's also deeply associated with our very history, culture, and ethnicity. In Trinidad and Tobago, it's a matter of law, it's a matter of record, that we have had several iterations of law to treat with the concept of one dangerous drug in particular, and that is cannabis. In 1885, we had the Ganja Cultivation Licenses Ordinance. In 1894, we looked again at the Ganja Ordinance of 1894. We had the Ganja Ordinance of 1899. We had the Ganja Ordinance of 1915. We had the Dangerous Drugs Ordinance of 1928. Prior to 1928, effectively we as a country recognized, even in our customs laws, that we as a country allowed for the growth, exportation, usage of what is known as ganja or cannabis, what is known as marijuana, what is known in so many different ways. And in fact, our Dangerous Drugs Act, when looked through the lens of our customs legislation, we find it even in our Customs Act number 22 of 1938. That is the current law. If you look to the current law, amended so many times over, and you look to part four of the general provisions, you get to section 33. In section 33 of the Customs Act, we're talking about no abatement for damage to ganja, which is imported. So this concept of this dangerous drug has been in our society for quite some time. What caused the regulation of cannabis, and I'll use the term cannabis for this debate because of its specific meaning as a chemical compos composition um, definitional reference point, what caused this to be under consideration is effectively our international reflection, which found itself into law and certainly into practice in Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, I'm speaking as far back as the first Geneva Convention, and then the second Geneva Convention in the period 1928 come forward. And then in particular, when we deal with the package of conventions and the protocol, and I mean the 1961 UN Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, the 1972 Protocol amending that single convention, the 1971 UN Convention on Psychotropic Substances, and the 1988 UN Convention against illicit traffic and narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances. That package of international law found itself, you must, of course, by now all be aware, when we sign on to international law, it does not become local law. We are a dualistic country, not a monistic type of legal regime. Monistic is where you sign a treaty and it becomes your law automatically. Dualistic is where you sign a treaty, but you must then bring it into local law. And what brought these conventions in large part into effect, effect are the Proceeds of Crime Act and the Dangerous Drugs Act. Those are the two pieces of law that manage this. In our Dangerous Drugs Act, Mr. Vice President, we find actually a very robust piece of law. And I'd like honorable members to reflect upon Chapter 1125. Chapter 1125 treats with all dangerous drugs and cannabis is treated as a dangerous drug. Dangerous drugs are defined in the section of reference. It's section three. Dangerous drug means a narcotic drug listed in the first schedule or a thing that contains such drug, etc. When you get to the first schedule, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Vice President, the first schedule is a list of narcotic drugs. When we get to item number three, cannabis with a capital C, Cannabis sativa, again with a capital C. Cannabis sativa L, their preparations, derivatives, and similar synthetic preparations as, for example, and then three of them are listed. Now, I've stressed the capital C because the capital C is the scientific reference to genus. Of course, you have order, genus, and then you go narrower. The more characteristics in common is the tighter the pack becomes in terms of um, reference to, to definition. I'd like to point out in this bill, we seek to capture a definition of cannabis, 
but we absolutely still maintain the first schedule. When we look to the bill itself, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Vice President, and we go to clause four of the bill, we have a definition of cannabis, means the plant of the genus cannabis, and you'll see it there. I've stressed that because notwithstanding what appears to be an expansive definition of cannabis in the bill, we must always be taken back to the first schedule. We are dealing with the genus cannabis. It properly includes hemp. Now, Mr. Vice President, in getting to this law, I need to put on record that we certainly looked at the laws of Canada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Jamaica, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, those countries with civil law jurisdiction in the European Union, Holland, for instance. But we also were extremely and happily guided by the report of the CARICOM Regional Commission on Marijuana 2018, which is an excellent publication under the hand of its chairman, uh, Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine from the University of the West Indies, who has been leading this charge in the Caribbean um, in a very holistic sort of way. And I wish to offer her a very public um, af affirmation of excellent work on behalf of the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. I think that that chairman, Professor Bell Antoine, has really done a significant amount of work in this area, and we in Trinidad and Tobago are better off for it. Mr. Vice President, what is this bill for? This bill, in its short number of clauses, nine clauses in particular, seeks to amend the Dangerous Drugs Act. The Dangerous Drugs Act says all dangerous drugs are matters of strict liability. You will find yourself tripping Section 5 of the Dangerous Drugs Act. You will be in possession if you have this substance. Substance possession includes under your control. Obviously, there's an element of knowledge that implies itself there, even though strict liability says you just need to be found with the thing. Your mental intention is not relevant. The law has evolved in terms of its application. Dangerous drugs, the offense set out in Section 5 of the Act, is what drives our amendments today in part. In Section 5, we see a person who has in his possession any dangerous drug is guilty of an offense and is liable, firstly upon summary conviction, to a fine of $25,000 and to imprisonment for five years, and if it's on indictment, to a fine of $50,000 and imprisonment to a term which shall not exceed 10 years, but which shall not be less than five years. We seek in this bill, A, to define cannabis, correlating it to the first schedule, B, to uplift the treatment of offenses for possession of all dangerous drugs, C, to carve out the aspect of cannabis, to treat it in a softer way driven by social justice with careful balance and parameters. We then also seek to modernize the law in keeping with the interpretation of the courts. I'll refer you in particular for the lawyers amongst us to the case of Barry Francis where we look to the fact that mandatory sentencing is no longer permissible under our laws. You cannot exclude the jurisdiction of the court from a discretionary point of view. So we tidy up the laws in that purpose. We also treat with the system in which we seek the criminal application. In that system, we propose a quantification limit treatment. We are disaggregating amounts between 0 to 30 grams of cannabis itself. We treat with cannabis resin, of course, in a certain quantifiable uh, limit. We then treat with 30 to 60 grams, and we treat 60 to 100 grams. We apply a system of law which says you will first be treated with a ticketable offense for amounts above 30 grams, ticketable offense for smoking in public, subjected to an actual offense if you are beyond certain amounts, that is above 100 grams, certainly above 60 grams to 100 and 100 onward. We preserve the trafficking aspects of it. We then, in the bill, Mr. Vice President, manage, if you don't pay the ticket, what happens? Your ability to contest the affair in court. 
We provide an alternate remedy to incarceration, obviously by providing for community service under community service orders. We then also provide for what happens if you have a charge for the, for the sums which we now treat with in new law. We say that you can have those charges discharged. We say what happens if you have a conviction. We ask you to go to court and have that expunged. We then treat with a pardon, which is a constitutional remedy coming via the Advisory Committee on Mercy in Section 87 of the Constitution and how you have that removed from your record. We then also treat with trafficking of new substances, in particular amphetamines, LSD, ecstasy, which were not included until recently as dangerous drugs. So we treat with the new cohort of very dangerous drugs which are really ravaging our youth in particular and are passed off as innocent things when you look at the packaging of that material. So that, in summary, is what the bill contains. But before we get into the particular provisions of the bill, permit me to speak to the constitutionality of the bill from a proportionality concept. Mr. Vice President, may I ask what is full time in this debate for me? It is, you end at 11.24. Much obliged. So let's get to constitutionality. Because this is a democracy. We are here pursuant to the Constitution, Section 53 in particular, to make laws for the peace, order, and good governance of our society. We are here as parliamentarians setting a standard. Suffice it to say, there is no unanimity of view on this particular issue. The government has spent, certainly at the Office of the Attorney General, we took the period 2016 come forward looking at this issue. We started by an, by an analysis in the prison system, the criminal justice system. We'll go into the data in a moment. Pursuant to the Prime Minister's green light that there was an appropriate time, one year ago, we started this exercise of looking at the decriminalization of cannabis, and we are here today. There are views that tell us don't do anything at all. In fact, make the laws stricter, absolutely ban it. And then there are advocates who say completely legalize the substance and let there be a free market economy in relation to this. We have taken a very cautious approach. It's driven by data. So in the whole concept of proportionality, in looking at constitutionality, the first thing is, is there a legitimate aim? Are the measures that we propose in this legislation rationally connected to that legitimate aim? Do we, in exercising the measures in legislation, go further than we ought to? Have we been proportionate in our interruption of laws to cause this to be managed? Is there, in sense, an adherence to the concept of what is contained in Section 13.2 of the Constitution, which is that this law is reasonable in a society such as Trinidad and Tobago's democracy. Let me repeat that, such as our own culture demonstrates. Obviously, there's a rational aim and connection. And I've described that in our cultural rooting. I've described that in the phenomenon, which I'm now going to go into in terms of statistics, which will really address this phenomenon. Mr. Vice President, at the AG's office, I think that the honorable senators here all know we have taken our time in every single piece of law to come forward here to deal with statistics, whatever it is, bail, preliminary inquiries, dangerous drugs, child marriage. I can tell you, now sitting in parliament, going on a 10th year in the year coming, that in my five years prior to my incarnation as the Attorney General, we had no statistics. We could talk about statistics all over the world, but we had no exposure to Trinidad and Tobago statistics. And I'd like to stick a pin today. And I'd like to say this for the record. One of the factors of social justice, which is a rational aim in this bill, is driven by my encounter, experience, and love for someone who sat in this parliament, in this Senate, on the independent bench. And I refer to, God rest her soul, Senator Corinne Batiste. And I'd like to stop for a second. That beautiful soul was afflicted with cancer. 
She suffered. She was warded. She was at the Vitas house. I'd make it my business together with my colleagues, Senator Vera as well, to visit her as she'd manage her illness. Frail in body, but fighting in spirit, she confessed, Faris, you might need to leave the room, boy. I need to smoke a little thing. In her affliction and for her pain management, she actually had cannabis prescribed for her. McKnight, Corinne, Corinne McKnight. Forgive me, I'm a, I'm a little emotional on this issue. She had cannabis prescribed for her, and I gave her a solemn pledge that I would look at this issue if I ever had the chance to drive law. And I want to say to Corinne today, her soul being surely with us today, that this social justice for her and for the many people in her circumstances really is an important measure for us, Mr. Vice President. Because not only has this related to people who have been incarcerated, whose lives have been thrown away, but there are genuine causes for people like Corinne, who really stood in the, in the breach and in the gap for this country. And today, if I can say so quite boldly, we do this for you. And Mr. Vice President, when we look to the statistics, and forgive me, it's not often I get emotional in the, in the parliament. But when we look to these statistics, Mr. Vice President, let's get to what Trinidad and Tobago looks like. Mr. Vice President, we have had the benefit of analysis. In the period 2007 to 2018, there have been 80,815 marijuana-related matters in the magistrate's court. Let me repeat that, 80,000 matters. The vast majority of those matters, 70%, sorry, 85% of those matters are for simple possession. Simple possession of quantities under 100 grams. Nearly 70,000 matters. Trafficking, which is anything over 1,000 grams, kilograms, sorry, is 14%. Cultivation, interestingly enough, is 0.6%. Gathering is 0.02%. What does that mean? The vast majority of our 80,000 citizens who have passed through the criminal justice system are there for simple possession of under 100 grams. What does that mean further? When we look to the statistics, Mr. Vice President, in the magistrate's court, there are, as at 2018, sorry, January 11th, 2019, 4,321 pending matters for marijuana. When we look to the marijuana in the classification of ages, we have in the period 2015 to 2018, I took my period alone, under 15, 38 people charged before the courts. 15 to 19, 902 people. 20 to 24, 2,848. 25 to 29, 2,783. 30 to 34, 2,466. 35 to 39, 1,639. It's worse when we disaggregate ethnicity. And it's not often we talk about it, but let's, let's call uh, the statistics what they are. We see in the distribution of our African population, Asian population, Indian population, Hispanic and mixed. In the category 18 to 35 Africans, we have 352 versus 18 to 35 East Indians, 124 versus mixed, 185. It shows, Mr. Vice President, that there is a preponderance of the application of this law, of the tripping of this law, in our African population. There's a preponderance of the law being tripped in our youth. There's a vast majority of it. Now, having 80,000 odd cases, 85,000 cases, is to be put in the lens of the fact that on average every year we have approximately 146,000 cases per year in the magistracy. We have 43 magistrates in 12 courts, not including the out courts. 
We have a systematic plan which this tenant has participated in to remove the chunks of matters that really ought not to be there. Motor vehicle and road traffic is 104,000 of those cases. Preliminary inquiries is 26,000 of those cases. Marijuana possession rated related cases is 8,500 cases per year. And if we move these things out under the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act, under the abolition of preliminary inquiries, in the decriminalization in the manner that we seek in this bill to do today, we're going to have 43 magistrates dealing with 7,500 matters per year. What can be more commonsensical from a criminal justice point of view than to disaggregate the matters, push those that don't need to be there, allow for the system still to work by causing those who need to come to court to still come to court or who want to come to court. So social justice, statistical driving, criminal justice, legitimate aim. Social justice tells us, Mr. Vice President, that when we look to the work at the forensics division, I can tell you, if we look at the figures 2009 to 2016 and we disaggregate forensic analysis for marijuana versus cocaine. And we all agree that cocaine is not being touted there as something that ought to be legalized or decriminalized, that there's serious issues with cocaine. What do we see? The ratio is roughly 80% to 20% analysis. 80% of the time spent dealing with cannabis, 20% dealing with cocaine. When we look to what the forensics division says, the forensics decision says effectively, look, if you stop bringing plant-like substances to the forensics division under 100 grams, you're going to take away more than 92% of our workload, leaving room to look at rape kits, DNA analysis, dangerous drugs such as cocaine, opium, ecstasy, other factors, and even treating with forensics in firearms, ammunition, and other positions. Now, that's all commonsensical. It's why Chief Justice Archie, every single year in the end of term and in the opening of term publication, said to this country, for heaven's sake, look at decriminalizing marijuana. And Mr. Vice President, I wish to commend the Honorable Chief Justice for having that courage every year. But I want to commend the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago who genuinely led our cabinet into the position where we could consider this issue. It's true that I may have been a bit of a nag in the purpose in trying to push this forward for all the right reasons and my colleagues in support, but I'd like to say that the Honorable Prime Minister has had the courage to do what no other Prime Minister has done in this area and for all the right reasons. So, Mr. Vice President, let's get a little further into the bill now. The bill before us, and I'd like to say that we made some amendments in the House of Representatives. They're reflected in bold in the legislation before us. We are proposing, Mr. Vice President, to bring to life something which could have been done all the time. Section 4 of the Dangerous Drugs Act allows the Minister of Health to publish regulations to treat with manufacture, import, export, distribution, sale, medicinal aspects, etc. but it was just never done. I am very pleased to tell honorable senators that we have in fact already drafted the regulations. I have them in my hand. The regulations to be promulgated under section 57.1 are drafted already so that the prescribable cannabis, the THC quantification aspects, can be dispensed through pharmacies under prescription, under management. It's why we have not taken to the course of prescribing cannabis by reference to THC or CBD, which are the chemical components. THC being the hallucinogenic aspect of the drug, the dangerous drug, cannabis, and CBD being less than that, under 0.3% in terms of its uh, chemical uh, position. That is the safe amount. But we are proposing in this legislation, Mr. Vice President, that we actually bring to life the regulations under Section 4 of the Act. We don't need an amendment for that. We just needed to do it under Section 57 of the existing law, and we have it ready. So let's deal with the bill. 
We propose a definition of cannabis in its wide form. It is specifically tied to the genus of cannabis set out in the first schedule of the Dangerous Drugs Act. We did, for the record, Mr. Vice President, introduce the withdrawal of certain drugs. Uh, Minister Dialsing did that on the 8th of November 2019 by Legal Notice 342. We introduced the um, ketamine and acetaminophen into the positions. I thank Senator Amin for her quick draw today. Um, we dealt with the positions of ecstasy and LSD, lysergic acid, in its combinations. We have dealt with the um, position of regulations for amphetamines and metaamphetamines in this particular regime in Legal Notice 345, etc. And we basically took the opportunity to amend the second schedule to harmonize the psychotropic substances under the Single Use Convention and the international regime. So we brought our laws up to date. When we go to the definitional section in Clause 4, we're looking at, as well, very importantly, the, the definition of cannabis resin. We've separated out the, the derivative that can be the reduction of the cannabis plant into the resin, which is a more potent form. We have defined public place in a narrower form than when the bill was first introduced. We have specifically put the limitation that a public place does not include any premises in actual use as a dwelling which are not used for commercial purposes. And we've borrowed from the laws of Antigua in particular in looking at this definition of a public place. Why? Because we seek to criminalize the smoking of cannabis in a public place. Because if you wish to do it, and I want to remind, a doctor sent me a message while I was in the house. Cannabis is not cabbage. It is a psychotropic substance. People are not encouraged necessarily to be smokers. There have been some radically difficult stories on the use of cannabis. The government proposes a rigorous campaign of education via the Ministry of Health, via the Ministry of Education, social services in this arena I want to say to all people in Trinidad and Tobago, I don't personally recommend the smoking of cannabis. Same way I don't recommend the smoking of cigarettes or excessive use of alcohol, etc. This is something that has, it's obviously a personal issue. And on that point, you will not see in the law any reference to recreational use or personal use because the single convention specifically prohibits that. Jurisdictions around the world have been ratching it. They have been faking it by calling it prescribable cannabis. They say it can be recommended. Effectively, you go to a place in a public environment where it is controlled. We have set up a joint select committee to deal with the delivery by way of industry because everywhere around us, we are looking at an industry. I gave you the statistics for cultivation and gathering. We're under 1%. In other words, then, the cannabis that we have in this country is imported. It comes from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It comes from South America. And people need to be careful of what you have. What additives are put into that? Does the person who is giving it to you um, lace it with something to cause addiction or to cause substances? Minister Randall Mitchell told me some frightening stories of colleagues of ours coming from Presentation College who became hooked on the substance and learned that they were actually being laced with, addic with additives which cause addiction. Some of them ending up in St. Anne's, some of them ending up in some serious conditions with their lives thrown away. I'm not saying it happens to everyone, but there is a different experience. It's not like alcohol, which has a sedation factor over consumption. It's a psychotropic substance which has different effects upon different persons. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Vice President, when we get to the amendments at Clause 6, where we amend Section 5 of the Act, Section 5 of the Act, and I did provide all members with a consolidated amendment. I, I hope it was circulated of what the Dangerous Drugs Act looks like. Again, I'll ask you to note that that, is, that has not been traditional in our parliament, but it is certainly traditional from me as Attorney General. In Section 5, we are proposing that we amend the penalties for all dangerous drugs. We've raised those penalties up to $250,000 and five years, as opposed to $25,000 and five years for summary offenses. 
We have raised the indictable up to $1 million and 15 years because we're seeing it for all dangerous drugs. But we have specifically carved out that possession of 30 grams of cannabis or five grams of cannabis resin is not an offense. And that possession of four growing plants, not distinguished between male or female, and I just say that the male inclusion in the earlier iteration came from the forensics division's insistence upon it. But we've had a lot of um, commentary coming from a few experts and the population at large. We were guided by that, and we went to the fact that you can have just any plant, being either male or female, because you don't know what you're going to get. And we are seeing that under 30 grams of cannabis, which, by the way, is three cigarette packs of 20 cigarettes each equivalent of cannabis. It's a lot, effectively. And therefore, I respectfully suggest that anybody that's pushing for more really has to have a little look at whether they need some rehabilitation or some management. I don't know what the consumption prescribed amounts are. I'm just seeing it from a, an anecdotal, uninformed, uneducated aspect in terms of scientific application. I can't see, right? Because this is possession at any time, per person. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what we propose is we treat with a bracket of 30 to 60 grams of possession. And we say that if you are in possession of 30 to 60 grams, you're going to be subjected to a ticketable offense. The ticketable offense is set out in subsection 16, as we propose here. It's a $2,000 ticket. We borrow from the regime of fixed penalties and how they are done by having a ticket issued to you. You can accept the ticket. You can pay the ticket. Even though it says you must present the notice to court, I want to remind you this law specifically applies to the payments into and out of court. In other words, then you can file the notice electronically pursuant to the rules of court. You can pay electronically. In other words, then you don't necessarily need to go to the court. I'm very pleased to say at the AG's office, Registrar General Intellectual Property, we have finally got electronic payments under control. We signed the agreement with FCB. We'll be going live in December. We are replicating that to motor vehicle and road traffic, to licensing division, to customs across Trinidad and Tobago, bringing to life the law which was passed in 2011. Mr. Vice President, we say that if you are treating with the fixed penalty system and you can't pay the penalty, you, or you don't want to, you have the opportunity to go to the court. You can have that dealt with by way of presenting yourself before the court. We then say that if you can't pay the penalty, the court should look to the community services aspect. And we say that the court may make a community services order to perform 30 hours of community service for possession of the amounts between 30 to 60. The Community Service Act says in that law that they cannot prescribe an amount of under 40 hours. This law is a law which impliedly repeals that aspect for cannabis. There is no inconsistency in that law. The 30 hours will stand, and that is upon a conviction. We treat with, Mr. Vice President, the removal of references to marijuana. Because they use cannabis in the first schedule. They use marijuana in the act. They spelt it differently throughout. We've harmonized the reference to cannabis in particular. Mr. Vice President, we then treat with the amount of um, possession for the substance known as ecstasy, which is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. We treat with the possession of lysergic acid diethyl amide, which is LSD. We treat with ketamines. We've added those in thanks to Minister Dialsing and Minister Young by way of the amendments to the dangerous drugs um, and the food and drugs regime by way of orders, which I've referred to a little bit earlier. We then treat with in the proposed section 5A, what happens if you smoke cannabis in public? And we have, thanks to a recommendation coming from the House, we took that into a ticketable regime. We are applying the same formula of fixed penalty notices. In treating with that, we have said that you'll be subjected, as subsection 16 says, to a ticketable offense of $2,000. Again, the regime of community service, if you can't pay the $2,000, we are proposing, in default of that, that the court treat with you, obviously, by way of subjecting you to $50,000 for the offense of possession and $75,000 for
for the offense, sorry, $50,000 also for smoking in public. We say that the minister may, by affirmative resolution, and I'm sure Senator Mark would be very happy for that, prescribe certain places where cannabis can be used. That is to allow for the law to develop over time. We may or may not look at how an industry develops. Under the Cannabis Control Bill, which has been referred to our Joint Select Committee, that's where we deal with licensing regime. That's where we deal with prescribable medical cannabis. That's where we deal with religious cannabis for certain faiths, beyond Rastafarians, who are obviously there are certain faiths that profess use of this as a sacrament. We treat with those there. Ultimately, our country really wants to get to the place where you ought not to be having cannabis grown at home. You ought not to be smoking it in places. The best, the best industry that drives this reform and management of it is really that you have certain designated zones so you can be monitored. You know how much is administered. You have a clinical record. You know about the smoking in certain locations so that it can be managed from a more scientific and societal um, regulation point of view. Mr. Vice President, we propose, again coming from a recommendation, coming from the Honorable Prime Minister, in treating with the Prime Minister's recommendation as to what happens between the bracket of possession of 60 grams to 100 grams, we felt that we should certainly treat with that by way of an offense, which is also to be treated separately from what happens in Section 5.1. Section 5.1 is where you are tripping possession of a dangerous drug. Section 5.1, we have amended to say, if you are in summary route, we've moved from $25,000 to $250,000, we've kept the five years. Under the indictable route, we have moved from a small penalty up to $1 million. Of course, there's ex we've kept the jail term prescribed there. We are saying for possession of cannabis between 60 to 100 grams, treat that differently from that regime. And we are saying possession of that ought to be managed by way of a regime which says, again, you'll be subjected to an offense. You will be subjected to having community service imposed upon you. We've gone to 50 hours of community service. We have said that, and this is to be found at page 15 of the bill in the new proposed 5D, where we say notwithstanding any other written law, um, we, we treat with the application of the law, I'll come to that in a moment, but we're saying specifically that we want to refer you back to 52 capital B, and we are going to have that regime where you are subjected to a penalty, you can do the community service. Let me get to the application of the law point, which is really the important aspect of this. It's standard knowledge now, pursuant to the application of the Privy Council case in Leonage. Leonage is the proponent who went before the Privy Council. In Leonage, the Privy Council affirmed the position that if you are going to ask for retrospectivity in terms of law, that you need to do that by way of a specific reference from the Parliament. Parliament must be deliberate in its indication that the law can apply retroactively. If we pass this law and we don't include the retrospectivity provisions, it'll only be people charged after proclamation who would have the benefit of the law. I want to point out in the section 5D at page 15 of the bill, we're saying at 5D1, a person who was charged for the possession of not more than 60 grams of cannabis or not more than 10 grams of cannabis resin before the commencement may apply to the court for a discharge of that offense. Mr. Vice President, do I go to 1129 or 21? Pardon? Thank you, 24. We say absolute discharge. In other words then, take everybody who is on a charge for under 60 grams and just clear them out the system. We could not pass a law which just said automatically because it'll become very disorganized in the court records. So as your matters come up, you apply for a discharge pursuant to 5D, and we're seeing that that applies going back. In other words, then there's retrospectivity. We then say in subclause 2, notwithstanding any other written law on or after the commencement of the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act, a person who was charged for possession of more than 60 grams, but mo not more than 100 grams, that, and then we treat with the resin as well, before the commencement of this act, and is convicted in relation to that charge, on or after the commencement, shall be liable to the fine specified in 5.2b, 
and to be dealt with in accordance with 52D. In other words then, we're taking them out of the system. We could not treat with the automatic discharge because it's a higher sum. If we're decriminalizing, we have to disaggregate the approaches. And again, if you come up before the court, retroactively applying to all offenses in the back, you have the benefit of this law. We then provide for the expunging of your records under the Police Service Act Section 50K. We then provide for what happens if you want to have your criminal record removed completely by a pardon. There is a very important case which came from the Privy Council. It's Lendor, if I just use the single term for it. Lendor effectively says that, unfortunately, the Mercy Committee cannot receive applications en masse. You can't take a category of people and just treat with them by way of pardon. Regrettably, the Privy Council says you must have every single application come before you. And I'd like to tell you, as a member of the Mercy Committee, the Office of the Attorney General, the Attorney General sits on that committee, as does the Director of Public Prosecutions and the Minister of National Security and other people. What we are doing is we're putting in a dedicated regime to treat with the applications. Because we expect, the data says you've had over 85,000, 80,000 cases. We expect to get a significant number, and we're putting in a mechanism to treat with that. Similarly, we've spoken to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to treat with the expunging under Section 50K. We've also treated with the judiciary, and I want to commend again Chief Justice Archie for continuously taking the judiciary in the right direction, aggressively pursuing reform. Chief Justice Archie is driving that aspect of administrative management of how we treat with it in the magistracy. After all, we birthed the criminal division. We've computerized the magistracy. We have recording technology. We're about to close this parliament this month move this parliament from this location back to the Red House and move the entire civil jurisdiction, including the appellate division, to this building, freeing up approximately 60 to 70 courtrooms for criminal matters. That is no small feat, honorable senators, honorable colleagues. This is how Trinidad and Tobago begins to change itself. Mr. Vice President, I genuinely commend this law to the reflections of my learned colleagues. I look forward to any improvements that we may make. I would genuinely like to have this managed. I know that the government is pressing a little bit hard at the agenda of honorable senators. We're, in fact, inviting senators to return next week to treat with the preliminary inquiries um, third round without anticipating that law. I'll just say the reason is we want to abolish preliminary inquiries in January. And if we wait for the parliament to resume, you might be looking at the end of January. We need, as a country, to get rid of the roadblocks. And there can be no greater roadblock than the preliminary inquiry system. Mr. Vice President, I welcome the senators opposite and at the independent bench and my own colleagues' contributions. I was very pleased in the House of Representatives that the opposition supported the legislation. And I beg to move. Honorable Senators, I shall now propose a question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled an act to amend the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125, be now read a second time. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for allowing me to make my intervention on this bill to amend the Dangerous Drugs Act. Mr. So Vice President, may I say from the outset that we are very disappointed that this bill did not go to a joint select committee as the cannabis control bill. I don't understand, and, and the AG has not given us an explanation. Why did the government chose to debate this bill and send the cannabis control bill to a joint select committee? When, Mr. Vice President, both are interrelated and inextricably bound together. 
So I think that we need to record our disappointment. And I would still insist, even though we have borne the root of passing it in the other place, that this matter ought to be really referred to a select committee of the Senate. Because there are some areas in this bill, even though in principle we support as a party the decriminalization of cannabis and the users of it and all the numbers that the AG has given us in terms of the 80,000 matters and 85% for simple possession of 100 grams. And that, yes, it will bring about some degree of fair play and justice for the citizens who have been caught in this web. But Mr. Vice President, we have to appreciate that this is a bill when you examine it very closely. There are some areas that we are going to be suggesting that the Attorney General look at and examine very carefully. Mr. Vice President, we have always supported decriminalization of cannabis in small, in small amounts on this side. And as a party, we choose to respect the advice of our country's religious leaders and religious organizations who still outside of the Rastafari organizations, advise against the legislation or decriminalization of cannabis for recreational use and against opening the doorway to making cannabis a lot more prevalent and visible within our society than it has been before. So we have the Muslim community and many Christian groups in our country who have spoken out against this legislation. And it's something that we cannot ignore. And I want to put on record the views. There's a paper by the Islamic, by the Muslim community in this country that deals with this whole decriminalization of marijuana. And there are many signatories to this document, Mr. Vice President. So it is a, it is a very um, serious matter. You have almost, in fact, the paper registers, that is the paper I have before me, the position of the Muslim community regarding the announced intention of the government to proceed along the, this path. And the undersigned organization represent the majority of the Muslim population in this country. And we have Maulana Sadiq Atman Nazir, Yaqub Ali, Brother Khan, Imran Hussein, Mufti Khan, Idris Muhammad, Manwa Ali, Brother Hafiz Khan, Maulana Shiraz Ali. And you have a number of organizations that have expressed their views. And I think, Mr. Vice President, as we proceed with this debate, we can't ignore some of the concerns of our religious and other leaders who have indicated reservations about this. And therefore, the government is advised to 
pay some attention to some of these organizations concerned. Now, we as a party have always, as I said, supported decriminalization of cannabis for medical and scientific uses, and even the constitutional rights of citizens to exercise their religious freedoms. But cannabis being an internationally regulated and restricted substance, we have always advised and wanted to ensure that when the issue was addressed, that it would be addressed, Mr. Vice President, properly and efficiently, so as to effect the best possible outcome for all our citizens in this beautiful country. We have some concerns, and I would like the Attorney General to pay attention to some of the concerns we have. We support the bill in principle, as our colleagues have done in the other place. But we are here to strengthen the legislation and to ensure that we bring about a balanced approach to what we are doing, Mr. Vice President. The bill consists only of nine clauses, but it is clear to see that the bill, if not carefully looked at, can open the doors to a host of issues, problems, and even consequences, both domestically and internationally. I am hopeful that the government and the Attorney General understand the consequences that can result from our decision regarding this measure. And to suggest amendments, possible amendments, that would serve to strengthen the proper motives of this bill while preserving integrity and prudence. So, Mr. Vice President, we have no problems with the first three clauses of this bill. Within clause four, clause four of the bill, we would like the Attorney General, as it relates to definition, to include a separate definition for private place or dwelling home. And this should be inserted to give better contrast to the definition of public place. So we are asking the Attorney General to look at a definition of private place or dwelling home. The definition of smoke, we would like to submit an expanded definition for the consideration of this honorable sense. Now, Mr. Vice President, in clause six, this clause deals with a number of amendments to section five. And in section five, subsection one A and B, the penalty for possession outside of the new prescribed limit is drastically increased from 25,000 to $250,000 on summary conviction, and from 50,000 to $1 million on conviction, on indictment. We find these are too drastic. These are drastic increases if we are talking about decriminalization of this substance or narcotic. And therefore, we will also circulate an amendment 
to address that. Now, in subsection 2 of subsection 5, of section 5, rather, the government is proposing that we allow, without any level of penalty, the possession of up to 30 grams of cannabis or up to 5 grams of cannabis resin and the allowance to cultivate no more than four cannabis plants. Now, this allowance for possession and cultivation without any accompanying penalty or without any formal license, inspection, or monitoring process can lead to serious harm in relation to public health and safety. I think that the Attorney General ought to pay attention to this aspect very carefully. And I want to advise the Attorney General that I too, like him, have in my possession the three international drug treaties that Trinidad and Tobago have signed on to. And I will show how we are in breach of sections of these treaties, even though we have not domesticated them into law. But we are committed internationally to these treaties because we have ratified them. Mm -hmm. So we are advising, Mr. Vice President, that we want to protect the public, and most importantly, our children. And we will be making amendments to ensure that this is done to strengthen the legislation. And it must not be a free for all. Mr. Vice President, we have heard, we have seen the government mention over and over that they are looking at decriminalization as opposed to legalization. But there's a document I want to send to the Attorney General. It's the European Legal Database on Drugs. It is entitled Decriminali Decriminalization in Europe. And they have made a clear distinction between decriminalization and legalization. But I didn't hear the AG talk about legalization whatsoever. But this is a conceptual difference that is located in this document. Yet, Mr. Vice President, we are just talking about decriminalization. But the government in the legislation have removed all sanctions both criminal and administrative, from the acts of possession of less than 30 grams of cannabis or five grams of cannabis resin, and from the cultivation of four cannabis plants. Now, may I remind the Senate that there's a convention, 61, the single convention on narcotic drugs. And this convention makes it very clear that it is unlawful and illegal outside of medicinal and scientific purposes for anyone to be engaging in marijuana and cannabis consumption without a license. You cannot have a free fall in this matter. You must have a license, you must have an authority to monitor that so that people don't just don't grow and grow and next thing, we have a marijuana country, a cannabis country. We have to be very, very careful what we are doing. And, and Mr. Vice President, I am saying that there are provisions in the single convention on narcotic drugs that supports my argument that there is need for regulation in this regard. So the complete removal of sanctions from these acts render these actions 
legal. So if there are no sanctions, then it is now legal to have 30 grams of cannabis and five grams of cannabis resin and to plant four um, cannabis trees. So the question here, Mr. Vice President, is that the AG must tell us what is he doing here? Is he engaging in decriminalization so that young black African youth that he mentioned in his contribution can have their record wiped clean for small grams and come back out in the society and live their normal lives? Or is he saying at the same time, apart from that, the Senate is being asked today to legalize in this country person's consumption of a certain amount of grams of cannabis without any legal infringement by law enforcement. And not only that, you have something called cannabis resin, which is more deadly. They are able to access five grams without any police intervention or law enforcement intervention. And further, as if that isn't enough, they can plant four trees. My information, Mr. Vice President, is one tree, marijuana, if it is well groomed, can give you from one gram to 6,000 grams. One tree can give you from one gram to 6,000 grams. So if you give, Mr. Vice President, yeah, I'm telling you what the literature and the research is doing. It is no super treat. It is what the literature is telling us. So we have to be very careful in terms of what we are doing here. So you having people having warehouses of marijuana and, and, and cannabis, we have to be careful. And this is why this thing should have gone to a joint select committee, so that people could have go through this thing carefully. But, 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 but the government is on cheap politics. They are on cheap politics. They believe this could win them an election, but they don't care what impact it will have on the country's children. That is what they don't care about. Mr. Vice President, would you believe that there are no regulations governing this piece of legislation? You have somebody who could plant four trees, and, and we have no regulations governing how this thing is going to be done? Who is going to be monitoring these people? Children coming from school in a backyard, marijuana free. Cannabis. They can go and, and take leaves, wrap it up, and smoke. Is that what we want for our children in this country? Where is the protection for our children? This thing has grave, incalculable, consequences if we do not think it through properly. There's a difference between decriminalization and legalization. And what the government is trying to do here through the back door is to legalize the smoking of marijuana in this country. I have no problem if people want to smoke, but we have to protect our nation and we have to protect our children. And therefore, Mr. Vice President, they have legislated that possession of anything under, look, look, look in Jamaica. Jamaica understood what decriminalization meant. You know what they did in Jamaica, Mr. Vice President? In Jamaica, they said, they legislated that possession of anything under 56 gram would be punishable by a fixed penalty of five U.S. dollars, not, not 250,000. If you want to decriminalize, decriminalize something. Why are you going to have a million dollars and two million dollars? That is not making sense. Come down like what they did in Jamaica to five dollars U.S., a small penalty, Mr. Vice President, but it's a penalty. Mr. Vice President, the legalization presents many negative consequences for our society. The Attorney General must tell the country the truth. 
has he brought legislation in this parliament to legalize cannabis? He has never used the word once in his presentation. But Mr. Vice President, I want to say this legislation that we are debating today puts this parliament and the government and this country in direct collision with the single convention on narcotic drugs of 1961 as amended by the 1972 protocol. We are in contravention and we are in collision. You know what the treaty states in Article 23, Clause 2, Subclause B, that no cultivation of cannabis may be allowed except under a license by a government agency that is specialized to deal with those matters. That is what it says. We sign up to that. We sign on to that. So you bring legislation in this parliament in contravention to what we sign up to. So what you doing? I am saying they should go out for public comments. Not, I want to tell my, Mr. Vice President, I want to tell the Attorney General that the executive doesn't run the parliament. The parliament runs its business. We look after the business of the people. We are the bridge between you, the government that is the executive, and dictatorship, this parliament. So we must conduct our own inquiries into these matters. You are your, your consultation. That's fine. But we must have ours too. So Mr. Vice President, what I'm saying is that this contravenes with this particular, it contravene, contravenes rather, this particular um, convention, which the Attorney General needs to clarify for us. I want to tell the Attorney General, if you pass this legislation in its current form, you're going to get a warning from the International Narcotics Control Board. I, I, yeah, they met, I know you met them. I have information on when you met them too. You met them in March. Yes, you met them. But they, they told you you could go ahead. Uh. But you know what they, tell, but what they did tell you? And they did tell you, and they may not have told you, but they did tell you <laughs> that if you go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, but there'll be a warning. You know, Canada did the same thing that we are doing here. But they can't export nothing, and they can't import nothing. They're locked in. And Trinidad and Tobago will find itself in the same monkey pants. Can't export. Can't import. So, so you, you have to be careful if you want to engage in foreign trade, or how you go about your business. So, Mr. Vice President, within the international drug treaties, cannabis is regarded and guided under the section that deals with opium. The guidelines for cultivation, manufacture, and processing of cannabis directly follows those guidelines on opium production. Mr. Vice President, what this translates um, into, what this should translate to legally is that in those countries that have allowed personal cultivation of cannabis, that those persons can apply through a high court to gain the ability to cultivate for personal use opium plants. So we can graduate from cannabis to opium. That is where we can go with this piece of legislation in its current form. And I want the AG to study this thing carefully and consult with maybe senior counsel on this matter. Mr. V M M M Mr. Vice President, this is a grave matter of public safety. And even though we are supporting it and we support it in the other place, it doesn't mean to say when it comes to the Senate, we are slaves. We are going to be slavishly following. We want to strengthen the legislation to ensure 
that the public interest is protected. And that's what our role is here. And, and, that, and that is what we are proposing, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I, I listened to some of our colleagues in the other place, watch, looking at them on television. And you know, some of them are comparing cannabis with alcohol and tobacco. Would you believe that? That is the extent of the debate that we are experiencing in this country. How cannabis could be equated with alcohol and tobacco in, in a real sense? Mr. Vice President, you cannot compare that. You know there's a desensitization or desensitizing the children to the harms associated with alcohol, tobacco, smoke, which can physically be harmful when used around children. I want to tell you, Mr. Vice President, that cannabis has been described internationally as a psychoactive narcotic and used around children. The use of it around children should be specifically restricted. I know in the legislation that efforts are being made to do that in terms of schools and, and cultural areas and sporting areas. It is our view that the amendments that we have in this legislation to the Dangerous Drugs Bill have not considered any aspects of public health and safety and serves to take us back to a time before the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1915 before the narcotics legislation of, 19, of the 1920s to a time less concerned with health and safety. I want to advise the Attorney General, don't take us back a century in time in terms of lawmaking. We have no problem, Mr. Vice President, decriminalizing between 30 to 100 grams of cannabis possession. Okay, we are, you're going that route, cool. It will serve to greatly reduce the caseload. I agree with the, with the Attorney General on that. And greatly reduce the load on the forensics department. It will also save the taxpayers a lot of money Mr. Vice President, we have no issues with that. We have no issue with this kind of reasoning. We just think it should have also applied across the board to affect the 30 grams or less category. Mr. Vice President, in regard to personal cultivation of cannabis, we believe there should be a process done under inspection under inspection, license, and proper guidelines for security, monitoring, and storage to ensure the public health and safety of our children. I, we are concerned about the nation's children. That is what we are concerned about here, the nation's children. And we should specifically state that any decriminalization should be towards, that should be in the legislation. Nowhere in the legislation, the AG talk about Corinne Batiste, McKnight, and may her soul rest in peace. But I want to almost say he's being hypocritical. But I wouldn't say that I would draw, would draw that. But you know why, Mr. Vice President? Nowhere in the legislation that we are dealing with is there any provision on medicinal use? Nowhere. So where is this concern? What regs? I ain't seen no regs. 
Bring the Rex here so we can see it. Don't tell me you have the Rex. Bring them here. No, you could table them man, in draft form and we look at them. You tell me about pass the law first. Waiting. You want to blindfold me? Handcuff me? Kidnap me? No, 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 no. Yeah. So, Mr. Vice President, I am saying that the Attorney General ought to deal with these matters very seriously. And as I said, deal with, you have a treaty? The treaty says you cannot do that. You have to be guided by the treaty. That's what you have to be guided by. Inspection, license, personal cultivate, um, proper guidelines. Mr. Vice President. And it should be specifically stated in the legislation that any decriminalization should be towards medical or therapeutic uses, since therapeutic can be medical and can be applied to a wide range of situations, keeping us compliant with our international obligations. Put it in the legislation. That is why, Mr. Vice President, we don't understand, but I shouldn't say we don't understand. We know what this government is about. This government is about cheap politics. And this thing is to try to garner votes for the 2020 elections. And they don't care who they harm or who they damage or injured in the process. Once they get votes and they get back into power. It's a game. Anybody who have eyes can see the game that the PNM is on. Desperate. Why would you unhinge? one piece of legislation from another piece when both are interrelated and interconnected. Games you are playing with the people. So, Mr. Vice President, we are saying that there are some drastic increases in the penalties, which we do not support. We believe if you are, if you are dealing with decriminalization, you should deal like in Jamaica with some very minor costs in terms of um, amounts that are being charged to the people. So we are going to put recommendations to that effect. Then somewhere in the legislation, I saw 165 grams of cannabis resin. They amended the act to, to, to put 165. But I don't know if you understand what that means. 165 grams of cannabis resin can represent between five to 20 times its weight in cannabis. And also the toxicity of cannabis, based on, yeah, based on my research, Mr. Vice President, shows that it can be very, very high in many respects. So, Mr. Vice President, we are very, very concerned about certain provisions in the legislation. And we are going to be trying to strengthen it, tighten it, to make sure, Mr. Vice President, that the legislation protects the public interest and is not designed to promote a small element in the society. There, I have more to say on this matter in terms of the cannabis <laughs> control bill, but that has gone to a joint select committee. But I have information about the whole conspiracy behind this piece of legislation. People are coming from Canada, you know, to ensure that they direct this government on how to go. But I'll say more about that publicly at the appropriate time. And the AG is well here, is aware of that because he has met with the people from Canada. So he's aware. Mr. Vice President, I have a series of amendments that I'm going to um, circulate for the Senate's consumption. We are committed to decriminalization. We are not in support of legalization in the way that the government is proposing it. 
If you are coming with legalization of that, you must follow the international treaty. And we are a signatory to the treaty. And the treaty makes it very clear. Anybody who wants to plant marijuana in this country or cannabis, they must have a license, Mr. Vice President. They must be monitored. And there must be guidelines for them. Cannot be just for a free for all. Cannot be. Not in Trinidad and Tobago. That's what the PNM trying to do. But the international treaty is saying that they must do it differently. So we are going to be making sure in our amendments, we stick to the international treaty and its obligations, and we reflect that in the legislation. So at the end of the day, Mr. Vice President, we protect the public, we protect public safety, we protect our children, and we don't allow the government to go on a frolic of its own using the parliament for cheap political purposes and don't care about the consequences that will flow as it relates to our country and our future and our children. Mr. Vice President, I wish I had another hour because I have many more things to say about this piece of legislation, but I'll leave that for the committee stage when I would have circulated my and I'll be able to debate and discuss it further. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Senator Sikasad. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for the opportunity to contribute to the debate on an act to amend the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125. Um, Mr. Vice President, let me at the onset say that I'm in support of the measures delineated in this bill to decriminalize the drug cannabis. Those of us mature enough will remember 40 years ago Reggae star Peter Tosh released his song, Legalize It, protesting the criminalization of cannabis. The possibility that such a revolutionary step could be contemplated seemed well outside the realm of possibilities, but times have changed. In public places, the present fad is vaping of exotic oils in specially designer lounges. Some of us may recall the group of elder gentlemen gathered around a chillum or hooker freeing their minds. It is worth noting that some of the most brilliant works were produced by visual artists, poets, writers, and other creative people like Lord Tennyson, Virginia Woolf, Vincent Van Gogh, and Bob Marley, who indulged in mind-enhancing substances. Whether there's a direct correlation with their creativity and drugs is uncertain. Cannabis originated in the Kush Mountains in the Indian subcontinent and has been used in Ayurvedic medicine for more than 5,000 years. Cannabis contains more than 500 chemical compounds, which are still under research and study. It is also referenced in the sacred text of the Vedas, and some of its uses include medicinal, recreational, and religious purposes. Already, neighboring islands such as Jamaica and Antigua and Barbuda have replaced outdated cannabis laws. Canada became the second country with a legal national cannabis marketplace, make it, making it the largest in the world. Therefore, Mr. Vice President, while we are not the first in this endeavor, we are taking much needed steps to deal with the petty criminal offenses of possession and the resulting displacement and social upheaval of what could be the most productive human capital base. A secondary but important benefit from this bill is the savings which will accrue in reducing the thousands of matters before the courts and the expense of housing those incarcerated. As stated by the Honorable Attorney General, the costs run, run into billions of dollars. Decriminalization of cannabis. Once the bill is passed, cannabis will be treated like other controlled substances which are legal and regulated. Persons over the legal age, I'm assuming, this is not explicitly stated in the bill, who are in possession of 30 grams or less of cannabis will no longer be subjected to arrest and criminal charges. Amending the Dangerous Drug Act will reduce the volumes that the justice system must handle. As many as 8,000 matters will be removed from the courts and records will be expunged. The Forensic Science Center spends 80% of their time analyzing cannabis under 60 grams. Therefore, their time and resources will be allocated to more pressing matters. <coughs> cannabis cultivation. 
Mr. Vice President, in order for a cannabis market to exist, a structured approach to cannabis production and supply is critical. Cannabis farming, as exists in other countries, could create a new industry to meet global demand for medicinal and recreational cannabis products. The legal cannabis industry potentially holds economic benefits such as jobs, new businesses, expanded markets, and export sales. In 2015, Colorado, USA earned 150 million US dollars in tax revenue from the legal cannabis industry. 15,000 jobs were created. The spending reach of those persons and enterprises interfacing with the cannabis industries, such as accountants, restaurants, car dealerships, etc., was estimated at US $2.5 billion. It is estimated that for each acre of cultivated cannabis, uh, 10 jobs are created. If Trinidad and Tobago were to put 20,000 acres into active cannabis development, potentially 200,000 jobs can be created. Health benefits. The health benefits of medical cannabis include relief from pain and muscle spasm, nausea associated with chemotherapy, anorexia, anxiety, insomnia, and, in, and effective treatment of multiple sclerosis. Benefits are seen in the immune function, neuroplasticity, emotional and mood regulation, val vascular health and digestive function. Dangers of cannabis. However, Mr. Vice President, as with any drug, the potential for misuse, harmful and unwanted side effects is present. These include impaired driving, increased risk of stroke, brain changes that could affect learning and memory, and mental illnesses in involving psychosis. Education and awareness campaign. Mr. Vice President, of critical importance in the actualization of the measures contained in the bill is a comprehensive information dissemination campaign. It is vital that both the public and law enforcement are well informed so as to avoid missteps as the law takes effect. This cannot be a one-off exercise and continuous efforts must be made to reinforce the important aspects of the bill. Mr. Vice President, with these few words, I thank you. Minister of Labor. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute on, on the debate on the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Bill 2019. Mr. Vice President, as I rise, uh, I wish to state that I am in full agreement and full support for the decriminalization of cannabis, also known as marijuana, also known as weed, also known as sundry other things. The objective of this bill is to make several amendments to the Dangerous Drug Act, Chapter 1125 and to work in tandem with the Cannabis Control Bill 2019, which will allow for the decriminalization of cannabis and to make provision for matters connected therein or within. My focus, Mr. Vice President, this morning would be somewhat different to my colorful senatorial colleague, Senator Wade Mark. I will focus on the impact on cannabis in the workplace. Mr. Vice President, there is no doubt that in Trinidad and Tobago, marijuana-related offenses, in particular those relating to simple possession, have generated a plethora of cases which created a huge backlog as the Honorable Attorney General pointed out, and thereby overburdening the criminal justice system. Additionally, it is well known that convictions relating to such offenses create long-lasting negative impacts on the convicted and hamper those persons with regards to their future employability. 
Mr. Vice President, citizens ought to expect that the law should offer as much protection as possible from the dangers associated with the use and abuse of dangerous drugs. But they must also expect that the law will adapt and cater to all members of our national community in determining what ought to be criminalized or decriminalized. And it is within this context that this government is once again seeking to strike the right balance with this bill. In, in attempting to strike the balance, Mr. Vice President, we may not please uh, everyone in the process. But Mr. Vice President, let's look at what this bill aims to do. This bill has four central aims. Firstly, to define marijuana comprehensively as cannabis. Secondly, to decriminalize certain quantities of cannabis and cannabis resin. Thirdly, to prohibit the use of the substance in public spaces. Fourthly, all educational institutions and places of work, which will be my focus. And finally, to modernize the criminal justice system. Mr. Vice President, this government is concerned about the effect of the substance upon persons during the course of their work and operation of certain machinery. As such, the bill proposes to prohibit persons who, whilst under the influence of cannabis, do anything which may constitute negligence, professional malpractice, or professional misconduct. I wish to also emphasize uh, that a similar prohibition applies to any person who operates, navigates, or is in physical control of any motor vehicle, aircraft, ship, whilst under the influence of the substance. Mr. Vice President, at the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, the impact of the decriminalization of cannabis and cannabis resin on the workplace was carefully considered, as most, if not all, the organizations hold the use of cannabis and or possession is strictly prohibited in the workplace as enshrined in their respective human resources manual. I want to take the opportunity at this point in time, Mr. Vice President, to publicly acknowledge the work done by our librarian, Mrs. Diana Ramdiel Hariram, our senior legal officer, Ms. Sangeeta Bundu, and our legal officer, too, Ms. Um, Sunika Tyson. When this debate first started, our librarian, Ms. Ramdial Hariram, showed great initiative by producing a research paper for the consideration of our executive team, and thereby allowing the ministry to formulate a position and to share with the Honorable Attorney General. So I want to publicly acknowledge the work of these three hardworking public officers. Mr. Vice President, it is imperative that the government caution against the potential harming of others by industrial accidents, the preponderance of legal costs as a result, as well as highlight other safety and productivity concerns associated with its use in the workplace. I am therefore very pleased that this bill factors these considerations into account. Mr. Vice President, alarmingly, the, Hon the Honorable Attorney General, speaking in the lower house on Wednesday, the 11th of December, and up to a short while ago in this Honorable House, stated that the statistics from the judiciary revealed that in law, that in the law term 2017 to 2018, the judiciary reported 9,553 
marijuana related cases which came before the magistrate court with 8,316 being for possession of marijuana alone. It is even more alarming if one considers that all, that should all of these individuals be convicted, then we have a situation whereby they may end up shut out of the legitimate labor force as a result of having convictions on their records for clearly and apparently very small amounts of marijuana. This is not a tenable situation, Mr. Vice President, and this government recognizes this. This government has been making meaningful changes to reforming our criminal justice system, and this bill is but a continuation of that work. This bill reflects our commitment to modernizing the criminal justice system, especially at this, as it relates to the decriminalization of cannabis. Mr. Vice President, I will now look at certain key provisions of the bill and link it directly to what the impact on the workplace. Clause 4 men, Section 3.1 of the Act by inserting the definitions of certain words as cannabis, cannabis resin, a public place is defined, smoke is also defined. The definitions, uh, these two definitions are deliberately expansive. I won't go into them. The Attorney General would have highlighted them previously. But these two definitions are deliberately expansive to ensure that as many possibilities are captured so that there is little ambiguity. For instance, that smoking cannabis at one's workplace is prohibited by law. Let me repeat that again, Mr. Vice President. Smoking cannabis at one's workplace is prohibited by law. Clause 6 would amend Section 5 of the Act and decriminalize the possession of 30 grams or less of cannabis or not more than five grams of cannabis resin. It also increases the penalties for the possession of and trafficking in dangerous drugs. Clause 6 also prescribes that having possession of more than 30 grams, but not more than 60 grams of cannabis, or having possession of more than five grams, but not more than 10 grams of cannabis resin, will be governed by a fixed penalty system. Additionally, community service as an alternative remedy for failure or refusal to pay prescribed fines will now work towards easing the court backlogs. These provisions will be introduced by subsections 2A and 2B of the Act. Mr. Vice President, Clause 7 of the bill inserts new sections 5A and 5B, 5C and 5D to the Act. 5A criminalizes smoking or using cannabis resin in a public place, and a person that does so shall be liable on summary conviction to a fine of $250,000 and to imprisonment for five years. Mr. Vice President, at this juncture, I wish to advise that the legal costs, safety, and productivity concerns associated with cannabis use in the workplace has been addressed in several cases by the industrial court and was aptly captured by the industrial court in GSD 94 of 2017 between the oil field trade union, oil field workers trade union versus Wire Produce Limited by Her Honor, Mrs. Ram Pras. And I want to share with this honorable house, Mr. Vice President, part of what the court, part of the court's pronouncement. The court observed that, and I quote, foremost amongst these are the financial losses incurred by the employer as a result of mistakes made by substance abusers and the increased absenteeism which occurs. There may also be an element of vicarious liability resting on the employer 
arising from actions of a substance abusing employee, close quotation. In the case of TD, trade dispute 131 of 2005, TWO, that is the Transport and Industrial Workers Union versus Public Transport Service Corporation, the court upheld the employer's decision to dismiss a worker for using an illicit drug, namely marijuana, on the work site. The court noted that the employer conducted a fair investigation in the matter, and as such could not be faulted in the conclusion arrived. Further, Mr. Vice President, in the case of TD, Trade Dispute 228 of 2010, CWU, which is an acronym for the Communication Workers Union, versus RBP Lifts Limited, a worker was dismissed after failing a random drug test. The union claimed that the worker was unaware about random drug testing. However, drug testing was listed in the collective agreement signed by both the employer and the recognized majority trade union. Furthermore, the union, which was the RMU, recognized majority union for short, had never before challenged the drug testing in the collective agreement. The court noted the high risk nature of the job and cited the Occupational Safety and Health Act Section 10, which imposes a general duty on employees to act in a manner that is safe to himself and others. The dispute was therefore dismissed. Finally, Mr. Vice President, in the case of TD 110 of 2003, OWTU versus, I know some time ago I had problems um, with this company's name out of Germany. Um, who? No, 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 Shalom. Slumberger, right, Slumberger. Slumberger, Slumberger. Um, OWTU, the Oilfield Workers Trade Union versus Slumberger, incorporated, the worker was dismissed after the discovery of traces of marijuana in his blood while on a course abroad. And that course was organized and sponsored by the employer. Notably, the worker smoking of marijuana did not take place on the job. It took place off the job. However, the worker knew of the employer's policy on marijuana use and termination which may arise, but the worker chose to engage in the use of marijuana nonetheless. It's a personal choice. Additionally, the employer was engaged in an extremely high-risk activity involving the use of radioactive explosive and highly volatile substances. The, the court stated, that is the industrial court stated, that under the Industrial Relations Act, Chapter 8801, it was mandated to act inter alia in the interest of the community as a whole. Consequently, the court could not disregard the risk, not just to the worker's own life, but also to his fellow workers, innocent members of the public, company's property, and the environment whenever he smoked marijuana. The dispute was subsequently dismissed by the court. Mr. Vice President, the government is very mindful of all these the range of concerns by employers. And this seeks to allay, and we are about to allay those concerns within the provisions of this bill. We in this government, Mr. Vice President, are mindful of our own responsibilities to all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, Clause 5C, also creates an offense where a person has cannabis in his possession on a school bus or in or on any premises where children are present for the purposes of education or attending or participating in any sporting 
or cultural activity. And that person shall be liable on summary conviction to a fine of $250,000 and to imprisonment of five years. Mr. Vice President, Section 5C also creates an offense where a person operates, navigates, or is in actual physical control of any motor vehicle, aircraft, or ship while under the influence of cannabis. And that person will be liable on summary conviction to a fine of $250,000 and to imprisonment of five years. This is very, this provision, Mr. Vice President, is very important. The 2018 report of the CARICOM Regional Commission on Marijuana, which was chaired by someone in whom I have the greatest of respect, admiration, and fondness, Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine. And this, this report focused on my, in part, on marijuana-related vehicular accidents, and stated at page 35 of the report, and I quote as follows. There is substantial evidence that marijuana use does have an adverse effect on driving ability and increases risk of motor vehicle accidents due to the cognitive processes, that is, reaction time, judgment, perception, and perception of sensory stimuli and of time. However, some studies suggest the driving risk may not be as severe as previously considered. Refer to Sewell, Pollen, Sofoju, 2009. Additionally, Mr. Vice President, the Industrial Court in Trade Dispute Number 2 of 1991, the OWTU versus Nestle Trinidad and Tobago Limited, upheld the company's decision to dismiss two workers and found that the company acted correctly in dismissing the workers after it found them to be in possession of cannabis while in the company's vehicle following an investigation. Mr. Vice President, further to propose Section 5D, persons with charges before the court for the possession of up to 60 grams of cannabis and up to 10 grams of cannabis resin may apply for the offense to be discharged. 5D also proposes that persons convicted for the possession of up to 60 grams of cannabis and up to 10 grams of cannabis resin shall have that offense expunged from their criminal record and may apply under the Constitution for a pardon. Mr. Vice President, when we look at other jurisdictions, particularly within the Caribbean context, our Caribbean neighbors, Jamaica, Antigua, Antigua and Barbuda, they have taken steps to decriminalize cannabis use and possession to varying degrees, but usually a small quantity. Mr. Vice President, I see it therefore as a duty of this government and that of the opposition, only I, I speak to the lone opposition member, Senator Sean Sobers, his other senatorial colleagues seem to have abandoned him. You're holding the fort like a good trade unionist, huh? Mr. Vice President, it is the duty of the government and that of the opposition and that of the independent benches to support this bill to allow this country to catch up with our Caribbean counterparts and other parts of the world, and to move this country in a direction where the world is moving. Mr. Vice President, at the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, our research has shown that as countries continue to legalize the use of cannabis for medical and recreational reasons, a number of issues uh, have arisen with the management of its use, both in the workplace and outside of the workplace. In terms of employment discrimination, both in Canada and in some United States jurisdictions, marijuana use for medical purposes 
has been classified as a disability. This classification places a duty on employers in those jurisdictions to accommodate employees with a substance dependency to the point of undue hardship. In Trinidad and Tobago, the Equal Opportunities Act, Chapter 2203, offers protection to persons with disabilities as defined in the Act from discrimination in the workplace. Mr. Vice President, arguably, if cannabis is being legalized for medicinal purposes, a similar classification should be taken into consideration in order to further protect users from discrimination in the workplace. That is one school of thought. Mr. Vice President, with respect to the Occupational Safety and Health Act, Chapter 8808, popularly known as OSHA, which is an act established to guide and govern safe workplace practices. This act provides guidance on the general duties of both the employers and the employees. In relation to the use of cannabis and other intoxicants in the workplace, section 6.1 and 2 of the OSHA sets out the general duties of the employer to the employees as stated as follows, and I want to quote Mr. Vice President, for purposes of a comprehensive understanding of the impact within the workplace environment. Section six, general duties of employers to employees, and I quote, one, it shall be the duty of every employer to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, the safety, health, and welfare at work of all his employees. Two, without prejudice to the generality of an employer's duty under subsection one, the matters to which that duty extends include in particular, A, the provision and maintenance of plant and systems of work that are so far as is reasonably practicable, safe and without risk to health. B, Arrangements for ensuring, so far as is reasonably practicable, safety and absence of risks to health in connection with the use, handling, storage, and transportation of equipment, machinery, articles, and substances. C, the provision of adequate and suitable protective clothing or devices of an approved standard to employees who in the course of employment are likely to be ex exposed to the risk of head, eye, air, hand or foot injury, injury from air contaminants or any other bodily injury and the provision of adequate instructions in the use of such protective clothing or devices. And D, the provisions of such information, instruction, training, and supervision as is necessary to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, the safety and health at work. Mr. Vice President, Section 7 sets out the general duties of employers and self-employed persons to persons other than employees. However, Mr. Vice President, Section 10 of the Act sets out general duties, employees at work, and this is what it says. It shall be the duty of every employee while at work. This is subsection one. It shall be the duty of every employee while at work, A, to take reasonable care for the safety and health of himself and of other persons who may be affected by his acts or omissions at work. B, as regards any duty or, or requirement imposed on his employer to cooperate with him so far as necessary to ensure that that duty or requirement is performed or complied with. And C, to report to his employer any contravention under his act or any regulations made there under the existence of which he knows. And he's, he, he has the responsibility to use correctly the personal protection 
clothing or devices providing for his use under D to exercise the discretion under Section 15 in a responsible manner, that is E and F, to ensure that he's not under the influence of an intoxicant to the extent that he is in such a state so as to endanger his own safety, health, or welfare at work. Mr. Vice President, an, in, an intoxicant as defined in the OSH Acts comprises, and I quote, any alcohol, medicament, narcotics, and psychotropic substances, close quotation. Insofar as Section 10.1 requires an employee to ensure that he is not under the influence of an intoxicant, posits that marijuana, and this is Maguire 2018, and I quote, marijuana is an impairing drug that has become substantially more potent since recreational use came into play, with some products containing upwards of 60% THC, page 28, close quotation. There appears to be a school of thought against the recognition of marijuana as intoxicant or unsafe to use as a direct consequence by the discovery of the medicinal benefits derived from the use of marijuana and the number of countries that have decriminalized and or legalized marijuana. Mr. Vice President, at the ministry, we have identified that there are other workplace issues that will also need to be considered as we move forward. And I would just like to take the opportunity to highlight what these other issues are, Mr. Vice President. May I inquire how much time, how much more time do I have? 1247. All right. Let me try. Mr. Vice President, one, drug testing policies and pre-employment screening. An, employer views an, address, on a, an employer's views on addressing cannabis use in the workplace, particularly when cannabis has been prescribed for medical use, on whether the removal of cannabis from drug testing is an option for employers or not. There is a need to balance the duty of employers to provide a safe working environment on one hand, and the privacy and medical requirements of workers on the other hand. In particular, the Energy Chamber of Trinidad and Tobago requires companies in the energy sector to be STO certified. That is S-T-O-W, which is safe to work certified. And a similar approach is adopted in the construction sector, which is CHAS TT, which is Contractors Health and Safety Scheme for Trinidad and Tobago Certification Program. <coughs> Albeit being considered by Mr. Mikey Joseph and Mr. C. Gaskin, the CHAS TT Certification Program has not been formally implemented in the construction sector. However, Mr. Vice President, it is important to note that the store certification program consists of a drug testing component as part of its requirement. Mr. Vice President, B, consideration of impaired testing as opposed to the current approach of testing by employers for TAC levels in the individual's workplace. Second, the second issue that consideration must be applied to Mr. Vice President, the inclusion of risk management strategies for medical cannabis users as part of the risk assessments conducted by employers in accordance with the OSH Act. Mr. Vice President, we also have to look at human resource manuals whether or not there should be an inclusion or inclusion of marijuana as a restrictive item from workplaces, uh, even where it is medically prescribed for use. Another, another important issue, Mr. Vice President, workmen's compensation. For medical users of cannabis or cannabis resin, whether applicable, and if not, 
in what circumstances with, will it be applicable? Where accidents caused by employees being under the influence of cannabis at the time of the accidents. We also have to look at national insurance benefits, Mr. Vice President. We have to look at whether a worker can be entitled to sick or injury leave payments arising from cannabis use. We also have to look at employee health insurance plans in Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Vice President. The coverage or inclusion of employees who have been medically prescribed cannabis, uh, who have been medically prescribed cannabis for treatment or management of certain illnesses, especially in companies where health insurance is mandatory. And the need for policies to ensure workers who are under prescribed medical marijuana use are not disadvantaged in the recruitment or promotional activities. Mr. Vice President, classification of medical cannabis use as a disability. That also is another important issue that requires us to look at. Also, employment discrimination. The need for policies to ensure workers who are under prescribed med medical cannabis use are not disadvantaged in recruitment and promotional opportunities. And lastly, Mr. Mr. Vice President, disclosure-related issues as a result of marijuana being prescribed for the treatment of HIV AIDS. Mr. Vice President, as the minister, as the minister who is also responsible for small enterprise development, I wish to state that the ministry also considered the impact of decriminalization on small enterprises. One of the recommendations coming out of the CARICOM Regional Commission on Marijuana 2018 was that small farmers and small business persons should be included in production and supply arrangements with appropriate controls limiting large enterprise and foreign involvement. And as I, as I close, Mr. Vice President, this government has consistently demonstrated its willingness to act in the best interests of the citizenry and the welfare of our men, our women, and our children as they are paramount to us. All circumstances must be taken into account and carefully weighed. And this government holds the view that the course that will be in the best interests of our citizens' welfare must be chosen. The amendments being proposed by this bill will improve the lives of those who require cannabis or cannabis resin for medicinal use, as well as those who require it for religious purposes. The amendments will also significantly, significantly impact on our criminal justice system. And I strongly urge members of this honorable house to support the passage of this bill. I thank you kindly, Mr. Vice President. Honorable Senators, at this point in time, permit me to return to item three on the order paper as I have received uh, the correspondence from the Office of the President. The Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago by Her Excellency Paula May Weeks, ORTT, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces, to Mr. Rishi Tripathi. Whereas a Senator Saddam Hussein is incapable of performing his duties as a Senator by reason of illness, now therefore I, Paula May Weeks, President as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by sections 44.1b and 44.4b of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, acting in accordance with the advice of the Leader of the Opposition, do hereby appoint you, Rishi Tripathi, to be a member of the Senate temporarily with effect from the 13th of December, 2019, and continuing during the absence of Senator Saddam Hussein by reason of illness, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the office of the President St. Anne's, this 13th day of December, 2019. Honorable Senators, Senators are required to take the oath.
I, Rishi Tripathi, having been appointed a member of parliament, do swear by Bhagavad Gita that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I am about to enter. Honorable Senators, at this time, we will also break for lunch. So this Senate will now stand suspended until 1.45.